Hey! What's that? Stupidest Metroidvania ever! Zero out of ten? Rebel Transmute. Build as a Metroidvania with heart, you play as Moon Makono, a space scrapper on a mission to find her estranged mother. The two had a falling out when Moon's mother took a job with Foray MGC, a corporation not known for its ethics or general concern for human life. So, of course this company owns an entire planet, and of course something catastrophic happens that decimates the entirety of said planet. Now, it's up to Moon to set aside her anger and go find her mother. And what follows is a tale of transhumanism, union busting, anti-capitalistic rhetoric, regret, and forgiveness. Rebel Transmute is the latest Metroidvania you can add to your ever-expanding library. On the spectrum of Metroidvanias, Rebel Transmute would fall squarely under the Metroid-like category. Or would it go under Soulsvania? Nah, it doesn't have enough mechanics to be a Soulsvania, but it's definitely inspired by Hollow Knight. A Hollow Knight-like? No, nope, we're not making anything. A solo project developed by one guy over a five-year period, Rebel Transmute's a Kickstarter success story. And you know what that means. That's right. There's gonna be a room full of NPCs or statues with backers quotes all over the place, baby. It's my favorite part about indie games and absolutely doesn't shatter the versimilitude in the slightest. Anyway, Rebel Transmute wasn't a Metroidvania particularly on my radar, which is a shame because it's right up my alley with its higher than average difficulty, large map that you will absolutely get lost in on several occasions, and aggressively retro aesthetic. That's why I want to give a shout out to Jay Ballin, not just for his extremely generous and much appreciated donation of a Steam Deck for the channel, but for also requesting an analysis on Rebel Transmute. Without his request, who knows when I'd have gotten to Moon's Adventure. For a game that was developed in large part by a single person, it's an impressive, if not a bit buggy, love letter to the genre. I personally enjoyed Rebel Transmute a lot, when it wasn't frustrating the ever-loving shit out of me. So, Jay Ballin, I dedicate this video to you. It's the least I could do for your kindness. I just, um, hope you like honesty. Combat. Combat is, um, I don't even know where to start. Combat works decently, but it never actually ends up feeling great to use. It's hard to explain, but I'll do my best. Basically, I blame Hollow Knight for Rebel's weird combat feel. Rebel Transmute wants to be Hollow Knight so bad it hurts. Mainly what I'm referring to are two things. One, both games share a similar quote-unquote magic system. And two, both games have pushback when hitting things. Let's start with the magic system. With each hit, Moon increases the fluid or whatever in her syringe. And this fluid is used for healing and blood casts. Blood casts being special attacks like firing a piercing laser or releasing a cloud of poisonous gas. As you can see, very similar to Hollow Knight's soul system. The other thing Rebel does like Hollow Knight, but with far less success, is the pushback Moon gets from hitting an enemy with her gun. It just doesn't work as well or even make sense. If the knight swings his sword without hitting anything, nothing happens. But when he hits something, he gets pushed back because he's a little guy with a little nail. Makes perfect sense. With Moon, it's the same thing, but with a gun. Wouldn't you think a gun would push her back regardless of whether or not she hits something? It's just kind of silly and comes across as trying a little too hard to be Hollow Knight. Logic be damned. Ultimately, I feel like the dev just wanted to add Knight's pogo skill, which, in all honesty, he does a pretty good job in replicating. Pogoing off enemies feels good and is utilized in great, and not so great, ways. Where I think the dev falls flat on trying to duplicate the Knight's pogo skill is how he neglected to consider the Knight's attack arc. With the Knight's sword swing, I can be slightly off-center from the enemy below me and still nail it which can lead to some cool tricks. With Moon, you have to be directly above the enemy to pull off a pogo, and quite frankly, a lot of the enemy placements and level designs aren't conducive for pulling off the maneuver. And that's my biggest issue with Moon's standard attack, how rigid it is. It's a very short, straight shot that can only fire in the four major cardinal directions. And when the majority of flying enemies come at you shooting projectiles just out of your reach because you can't fire diagonally, or your stubby little shot isn't long enough, 
You can see how frustration quickly sets in. After so long, I just stopped fighting things. The ratio to how much fun I had with combat versus how much frustration combat gave me was just too out of proportion. I always felt disadvantaged in this game against regular enemies. Some people might say you should feel disadvantaged at all times as it adds more tension to combat and exploration. To these people, I say touche, but also shut up. You don't know what I've been through, okay? This game has way too many rooms that house a ludicrous amount of tanky enemies requiring a minimum of three shots, even to kill a tiny maggot. And until you've played through this game's wind biome with the flying robots that hurl projectiles at you off screen that go through walls, don't talk to me about adding more tension. But despite how obnoxious some of these enemies could get during exploration, I never felt the bosses were too much to handle. All the bosses on the critical path were pretty challenging and a lot of fun, and I always looked forward to them. What I didn't look forward to were some of the game's ridiculous runbacks. I've spoken of runbacks before, so I'll be brief. Runbacks are when a boss kills you and you're forced to traverse a long way back before you can rematch them because the dev decided not to place a save room outside the boss arena. They were made infamous in Soulsborne games and thus made it into Hollow Knight, so here we are in Rebel Transmute with runbacks. I'll never understand the philosophy in this kind of game design. Runbacks feel far too punitive to justify any actual benefits. Why not just place a save point right outside the boss room? I read from somewhere from someone forever ago that the devs for Dark Souls said they didn't like putting bonfires or save points outside of boss arenas because they wanted players to be surprised at stumbling upon a boss encounter. I guess that's a reason, but even FromSoft's abandoned this practice. A great and recent example would be Elden Ring using the Statues of America as checkpoints outside of boss encounters. I guess what I'm saying is runbacks are antiquated, annoying, and add very little value to the experience beyond padding and frustration. I didn't like runbacks when Dark Souls did them, I didn't like them when Hollow Knight did them, and I definitely don't like them when Rebel Transmute does them. It's 2024 people, it's time to let runbacks die. To be fair, not every boss in Rebel has a run back, but the ones that do, whew, they are doozies. I'd like to give a special shout out to the boss Cerebellum. Not only is it incredibly challenging, but it might have the worst run back I've ever experienced this side of the bed of chaos. It's so disrespectful of player's time, I'm actually impressed at how little of a shit the dev cared about player sanity. And I swear to God, if any of you put get good in the comments, I will ban you from ever watching my videos again. I don't think that's a thing I can actually do, but I'll make it happen. And guess what? I did get good, okay? Fuck this floaty head bitch. I suppose the last thing I'd like to say about combat is that even after finishing Rebel's 16 hour runtime, combat never evolved that much. Your gun pretty much stays weak the majority of the game, or the entire game if you don't explore well enough. And its range stays pathetic, despite the game's augment mechanic. And because I'm sick of referring to Hollow Knight every time a game basically has a fleshed out accessory system, I'm not gonna say Moon's augments are like Hollow Knight's charms, okay? Instead, I'm gonna say Moon's augments are like Paper Mario's badges. There, mixing things up every once in a while is good for your prefrontal cortex. At least that's what Dr. Kawashima always told me anyway. I'll dive deeper into Rebel's augment system in the progression section. For now, let's sum up combat. Moon's standard attack feels too limited and weak for the amount and types of enemies present in the game, with flying enemies being huge pains in the ass, seemingly always out of reach. Because you always feel disadvantaged and enemies are so tanky and everywhere, you soon drop combat simply because it becomes tedious and too time consuming, especially when enemies respawn upon re-entering a room. But despite my harsh criticisms up to this point, combat isn't terrible. Honestly, an easy fix would be to dial back on how many enemies there are in larger areas and maybe make flying enemies AI a little dumber. Seriously, these bastards will stay right out of your reach and shoot you endlessly. And with the verticality of some of these rooms, they can be a real nuisance. Ironically, I never found the game's boss encounters to be obnoxious. Each encounter was a great balance between challenging and fun, except for one optional boss. This dude moves like you're playing Mega Man X. It's bonkers and downright unfair, but manageable. On a completely unrelated note, accessibility options exist that you can toggle on the fly if you find certain parts to be too challenging. So that's cool. Anyway, it's easy to say boss encounters were highlights, even though some had runbacks that made me want to puke. Abilities. Moon starts the game with a pretty useful slide and gathers more useful abilities as she progresses. Air dash, sticky bomb, faster swimming, and a few others. None are super unique to the genre, but each adds just a little more pizzazz to the game's platforming. There's one ability you get that's simultaneously cool and derivative, the spin bash. 
You essentially Sonic the Hedgehog on top of an enemy to bounce off their heads. It's great, but you were already doing that with your standard attack. I literally just did a whole thing on pogoing in the last section. Spin bashing off something takes you a little higher than pogoing and does less damage so you can pogo more. But the main difference is that spin bashing can be used on environmental objects that pogoing can't. The big one being these plants with the, you know, things. You can activate and bounce off these only with spin bash. Granted, spin bashing off these things adds a lot to platforming and leads to some fun and challenging segments, but it still feels weird to have two different ways to pogo. Frankly, because we've already been using the gun to pogo, I'd have rather gotten a gun upgrade that let me interact with these environmental objects than get a move that rips off Sonic. Anything to make this lame gun better. Let's talk about the platforming for a minute. Rebels platforming isn't too bad and at times shines with some of the demanding sequences it's laid out for players, but it takes a while to get to where platforming's enjoyable. You'll find early game platforming to range from blase to Super Mario Maker levels of amateurishness with how pixel perfect some of these jumps have to be. Early platforming wouldn't be so bad if something like Coyote Time was implemented, but without such grace, the gaps between some of these platforms can feel unforgiving. And with how vertical some of these rooms get, any sort of slip up can erase a significant amount of progress, sending you tumbling all the way to the start. Naturally, the crazy amount of enemies on screen makes these sections much trickier. What's worse is that sometimes falling requires you to backtrack through a couple of rooms to get back to where you were. What's that mean? All those enemies you've defeated to make platforming easier? They've respawned, baby. It can get frustrating, but things get much easier and more fun as new abilities get unlocked, which is natural for any Metroidvania but also one of the genre's biggest shortcomings. Let's take a look at the Ori series. I know I've used this example before, so I'll be quick. In Ori 1, it takes the entire game to expand Ori's moveset to make its platforming interesting, bash notwithstanding. In Ori 2, you get almost everything from the first game within the first hour or so. This, in turn, makes the game's overall platforming so much better and unique when compared to its predecessor. Here's why I continually bring that Ori example up. Metroidvanias are platformers. To be a good Metroidvania, you have to have good platforming. Two major factors contribute to good platforming, fluidity of character movement and level design. Everything else is just gimmicks and icing on the cake. Metroidvanias specifically have a challenge when it comes to level design for many reasons, but I wanna focus on the most obvious one, utility-gated exploration. MV worlds need to be designed in such a way that limits progression, so it's not uncommon for early game platforming to be kinda dull because your character just can't do much yet. As your character gains new traversal abilities, that's when platforming ramps up. Therefore, it's vitally important devs find a balance between limiting players as a form of guidance and unshackling players to go out on their own. Obviously, the sooner players get unshackled, the sooner the platforming gets better. And the case study between Ori 1 versus Ori 2 is proof of this. I tell you all that so I can tell you this. I don't think Rebel Transmute gets its platforming right. Not only are its controls not as responsive as some of its late game precision based challenges demand, but the balancing is off. The game's platforming only really gets interesting and far less punishing when you get the air dash a couple of biomes in, and it only gets interesting and entertaining once you get the spin bash a couple more biomes in. All in all, general platforming in Rebel is pretty on par with average MVs, starting out kinda bleh and then getting much better later on. Though, I'd say Rebel's platforming is a bit more difficult than your average MV, due to lack of coyote time in combination with some pixel perfect jumps in the early game along with some punishing vertical areas. There are other facets of platforming that affect the game, but I'll save those for the exploration section. For now, just know the traversal abilities in Rebel are nothing new, yet add a lot to its platforming, especially because there are a few useful advanced moves that are never explicitly taught to players, but are super exciting and fun to use. But I'll leave those for you to discover. Progression. Much like her inspiration, Samus and the Knight, Moon doesn't gain EXP, level up, get gear, or have any stats to worry about, making Rebel Transmute very light on the Vania side of Metroidvania. Thus, why I called it a Metroid-like in the introduction. Why I jokingly called it a Hollow Knight-like is because of the augment system the game utilizes. Moon can essentially attach accessories to fundamentally change or add upgrades to her life suit. There are some important augments you need to find, like the one that increases your weapon's range ever so slightly and the one that turns you into a Red Flux magnet, Red Flux being the game's currency. Then there are downright overpowered augments like the Helper Bugs. I was able to eventually summon three of these bad boys at once and they were doing massive damage to enemies. Plus, they find hidden doors and rooms for you. Also, you can summon a Bush Sheep, and I love him. 
Rebel tries to be cute by replicating near automata by having augments that, if detached, remove your HUD or ability to heal. It's a nice throwback, but come on, you're wasting my precious battery here. Moon's life suit comes with a battery that starts at 30% capacity, and each augment comes with a value that represents how much juice it's gonna need. For instance, let's say you have 30% battery, represented by the whole number three, and an augment costs 0.5 to use. That'll take your capacity from three to 2.5. It's a fairly simple system, but I found the UI for the battery slash augment menu to be a little confusing at first. I don't know, there's just lots of tabs and it was tough to figure out which augments I had equipped and which ones I didn't. Maybe it won't be so confusing to you, but it took me a minute. Of course, you can find and purchase items to increase your battery capacity. Purchasing items requires red flux dropped by enemies or found in caches around the map. There are approximately 1,000 stores in this game and a majority of them are located in inconvenient spots that require a lot of backtracking, so that's fun. Each vendor, identified with a big V on the map, offers something unique, so each store discovery was a treat. The things you could buy range from augments to key items to maggots. Maggots are collectibles that supercharge save stations for some reason. Anyway, there are even services you can buy such as fast travel point and save station maintenance, or gun upgrades, or selling all your personnel discs and screwing yourself out of getting some cool blood casts. That's a fantastic service I'm glad the dev threw in there for me. Thanks for that! And that's it for progression. The light RPG elements are very light in this one, with the augment system being the chosen method for player expression. Ribble also has a healthy economy, so you can put all your red flux to good use. Exploration. So, you've probably listened to all the criticisms I've had up to this point and have determined I do not like Rebel Transmute. This is actually far from the truth. Despite all my complaints and the amount of frustration the game gave me, I really like Rebel, and I contribute my fondness for it and my overall enjoyment exclusively to how well its exploration is handled. Without a hint of sarcasm, I can say Rebel's exploration is some of the best I've experienced in a long time. I'm not saying it's perfect, good lord I'm not saying that, but it's done very, very well. Where do I start? I suppose I'll begin with the positives and then go to the negatives, yeah? First and foremost, Rebel transmutes a Metroidvania fan's Metroidvania. What do I mean by that? Well, there are gonna be a lot of Easter eggs and references genre fans will appreciate, that's for sure, but mainly I mean this game does not hold your hand. It'll give you some guidance by plopping objectives on the map, but by and large, the game wants you to get lost and discover stuff all on your own. And you will get lost a good few times in this game. There are multiple moments when progressing on the critical path requires you to backtrack to obscure, easily missable spots, and I love that. There are so many MVs I've played where moving along the critical path almost feels like a straight line. Not in Rebel. Here's a pretty common scenario. In order to progress, you'll have to go through Biome 1 and 2 to get to Biome 3 to get an ability that grants access to an obscure area in Biome 2 that leads to Biome 4. I love running all over the map finding dead ends, and having to retrace my steps until I finally find the way forward. I get how this could be annoying to some, but Metroidvania enthusiasts live for this loop. And Rebel does this so well. Every time I got a new ability, my mind would race to figure out where I needed to revisit so I could go a little deeper into a previous biome. I just love when new areas are unlocked in older biomes. I don't know how to explain it, I guess it just adds to that sense of discovery we MV fans love so much. Diving deeper into something we thought we knew so much about, that's good stuff right there. I found Rebel's world very intriguing. Each biome's unique, and the world's interconnectivity is fantastic. I couldn't help myself as I played. I wanted to see as much of this world as possible and how each biome interacted with each other. Where does this subway go? What's this mysterious new objective doing on my map? There are so many ways to enter the Coral Fissure. What could that mean to the narrative? The sense of wonder and discovery was very strong in this game, and I found it hard to put down. There's also a lot to collect and discover. Augments, red flux caches, all kinds of key items like health upgrades and echoes, NPCs with side quests, and the aforementioned vendors. Rebel even has its own grub father NPC that wants brain imprints instead of grubs. And this NPC rewards you handsomely, so you're going to want to find those brain imprints, which are naturally either well hidden or stuck behind a platform challenge or puzzle, which I always found to be a delight because sometimes I like little diversions while exploring. I think this is about the time I talk about some of the negatives to Rebel Transmute's exploration. There are a lot of demanding platforming sections and not enough shortcuts or ways to circumvent them. This makes backtracking an absolute slog in later biomes, the mines being a perfect example. But the coral fissure isn't any better. In fact, it's easily my least favorite biome to revisit in the entire game. It's just so vertical and requires a lot of climbing. 
The dev tried to alleviate the tedium of scaling the coral by providing copious amounts of shortcut elevators, but the elevators are so slow, and it's still really easy to get hit by the plethora of enemies in the area and get knocked all the way back down. There is fast travel, but there's just not enough. Only one waypoint per biome. I'll never understand why save points can't double as waypoints, but oh well. An odd complaint I have are locked doors. Throughout the game, you'll find doors that can only be opened if you either flip a switch or kill specific enemies in a room. But the game doesn't do anything to indicate which method opens the door, at least not when the game launched. So many times I've complained about something only to have it patched right when I dropped my video. I guess I'll end this section by reiterating that I really, really loved Rebels Exploration. I guess I like it when the critical path is tough to find. There was one time in the early game where I played probably for a solid two hours or so without gaining any narrative progress. I was just exploring and discovering biome after biome and getting so confused and lost and obviously I freaking loved it. I should also mention this game has corpse running, which is typically something I hate because I feel it detracts from exploration, but Rebel handles it pretty well, though I'd still prefer the mechanic not exist in the first place. Basically, Moon starts with an augment that drops one of her health orbs upon death instead of her currency. This gives players the choice to recover the orb manually or just pay 50 bucks at the save station you respond at to retrieve it instantly. I never had an issue with cash in this game, so paying 50 bucks is nothing. Just do that if you don't feel like retrieving the orb yourself. And that's all I want to say about exploration. I think it's fantastic, and the ever-increasing sense of discovery throughout the journey kept me hooked, despite all the things the game did to frustrate me. Just know that you will get lost, but that's part of the fun. Plus, the in-game map is solid, though you do have to buy markers before you can pin anything on it, so that's dumb. Backtracking can be a chore in some biomes, but Overall, it's not so bad. Rebel Transmute's world is big, hostile, and mysterious. And I think Metroidvania fans who don't mind a little difficulty here and there while traveling are gonna appreciate it. Atmosphere Narrative I was reading what other people and outlets were saying about Rebel Transmute, and I think the most notable statement I read or heard was from Nintendo Life, where they pretty much said the game was ugly and that they wished it looked better. I felt that was kind of harsh, but I guess to each their own. I mean, you have eyes, just look at the game. It's clear the direction the dev chose wasn't high def graphics or hyper realism. Looks to me like he was really leaning hard into an early NES Metroid aesthetic, and to that, I say he was highly successful. But take my opinion with a grain of salt. I grew up enjoying adventure on the Atari, so it's apt to say graphics have never been high priority for me. I'm more into style, and Rebel nailed what it set out to do. If you don't like how it looks, you don't like how it looks. But for me, I'm always down for retro aesthetics. The less bits, the better, I always say. No, I don't. <sighs> I've never said that. If I had to choose something I think needed a visual upgrade, it'd be the fast travel screen. Maybe some screen scrolling would have made it more believable. Each biome was unique and did a lot of the narrative's heavy lifting in the form of environmental storytelling. I especially liked the pulsing veins you'd see sometimes throbbing in the background. Each biome had its own set of distinctive enemies and that also helped with the environmental storytelling. And the music and sound design worked fine for me. Really, I don't have a lot to say about the game's atmosphere. It goes for creepy sci-fi dystopia and it mostly gets it right. It tries to steep players in a deep feeling of isolation, but there's just too many NPCs and summons to make you feel that alone. Plus, many NPC interactions were lighthearted and coded with humor, which I think subtracted more than it added to the game's disturbing atmosphere and subject matter. But its music is pretty awesome, either by creating moody settings or by rocking out so hard that it drowns out most of the game's other sound effects. At the end of the day, you know what's in store for you just by looking at this game. If you're cool with an NES Metroid feel mixed with deeper storytelling, you're gonna like Rebel Transmute's atmosphere. As far as narrative goes, I dug it. Rebel space chick taking down a corrupt organization that may or may not have murdered her mother. Sounds like a solid premise to me. However, when all's said and done, I think the story leaves a lot on the table. Meaning there was so much more it could have done with what it had, but for whatever reason chose not to do it which usually means the dev ran out of time and or resources. But I'll elaborate on what I thought was left on the table in the spoiler section. The one thing I thought was disappointing about the story was how Rebel was billed as, quote unquote, a Metroidvania with heart. I get what the dev was trying to say with that, but I don't think it panned out. Moon's character is kind of hard to nail down. With most NPCs, she's inquisitive and tries to be helpful. But with an NPC named Quirk, she's a complete asshole and tries to play the whole I don't do teams card, which felt weird and out of nowhere considering how kind she had been to other NPCs up to this point. Obviously, this ends with Moon and Quirk's relationship improving over time, but it all just comes across as forced and inconsistent. Regardless, the overarching plot and ending, of which there is only one, is satisfactory. Nothing's gonna blow your mind, and 
I found it all to be pretty predictable. I was actually able to call everything that happens in the game the moment I met Quirk, and even certain aspects before meeting her. I'm talking everything. Even the game's final revelation right before the final battle, which I'll save for the spoilers section, which is happening right now. Go to this timestamp to fast travel straight to my final thoughts. Spoilers. Welcome to the spoiler section, where every obscure thing is brought up and the format don't matter. First off, the story twists. I nailed every single one of them. I knew Moon died at the very beginning of the game and her AI was uploaded into the life suit. How else would you explain her respawning at repair stations? I'm not sure if the game mechanic intentionally gave it away or if this was just another nod to Nier Automata. Totally called Quirk being Moon's mom. Dr. Inaya being the evil bad guy all along because of course she was. And I even called the game's final revelation that all the robots who gained sentience on Terra 6 were given sentience by Moon's mom's consciousness splitting up among them all. That last one was kind of a shot in the dark, but still, I called it. The story isn't bad by any means, it just didn't do much for me. Mainly because I couldn't quite pin down Moon. Is she kind or is she a loner asshole? It just depended on who she was talking to, I guess. Inconsistencies like this just pull me out of stories. And for those who are interested, I think this game is an allegory for being or accepting yourself as being transgender. I don't have any concrete proof of that as nothing like this was stated in the game. At least nothing I found as I only got 85% completion. But it's heavily hinted at if you look at the clues and subtext. Themes of transhumanism, the anthro characters who changed their appearance to look like animals they identify as, the color scheme in the game's key art. And if that's the case and the dev created a story that's an allegory for transgenderism, I think they did a pretty good job. Most narratives around this subject matter, and you can take my word for this as an English professor reading student paper after student paper on the subject, come across as preachy or propagandistic because the message is prioritized over the narrative, which in turn makes the story feel inorganic and disingenuous. Rebel's dev didn't fall into this trap. Story was front and center with the message he wanted to get across relegated to subtext. This is the foundation of good writing because it keeps the focus on what's most important to your audience, story, characters, and plot. And it shows your audience that you respect their intelligence. I know that latter point seems silly, but I swear it goes a long way. However, I could just be full of shit and this game has nothing to do with transgenderism. That's always a possibility. Moving away from the narrative, I want to kind of shotgun some of the gripes I had with the game. The first I want to bring up is how this game does not have multiple endings. For a game that is as big and as long as this, that's a travesty. Especially because it felt like they were setting something up with the occultists. Once Moon realizes she's an AI, she's able to find these hidden monitors that house these entities called occultists. After defeating them, you get something called Hive Residue, but they never do anything. You'd think collecting all the Hive Residue would unlock something, but nope. Just an excuse to hunt down some optional bosses. Kinda lame, really. I hate it when devs put red herrings this big in their games. I get the argument that these occultists were put there to expand upon the lore, but I don't think that's good enough. Especially because the occultists bring up a character called the leader and the game never tells you who that is. Unless Dr. Inaya was the leader and calling her the leader was a way to conceal her identity, which is probably the case. I wouldn't know because the game glitched out on me and I could never get it to register that I beat one of the occultists. Regardless, I wanted way more than just lore for hunting down all these secret monitors housing optional bosses. The echoes you find in the game are another disappointment. Collecting all of them and taking them to this particular spot that's kind of hard to get to only rewards you with a health upgrade? That should definitely have opened up a portal to some realm where it's revealed some eldritch abomination was pulling the strings behind the scenes or something. Just another missed opportunity to reward dedicated MV fans. There are a few missable items in the game, which is always disappointing. I didn't know what to do with the personnel discs. I collected like 30 of them. I gave one to an emissary who then gave me a blood cast, which was a laser beam I never used. I tried to give more discs to it, but it was basically like, go away, I'm busy. I eventually found somebody who'd buy them, so I just sold them all. Turns out there are, I believe, three emissaries in the game you can give these discs to in exchange for blood casts, but my dumb ass sold them all. If I want to see what these other blood casts are, I'll have to replay the entire game. That doesn't seem too appetizing right now. My recommendation is to hold at least three personnel discs at all time when playing. There's even an augment you can miss. Apparently, there's an NPC you can speak to prior to fighting an optional boss, and speaking to it will give you an augment and make that optional fight easier. But I never found a way to talk to it. That means I missed the augment, and the fight was on hard mode for me, boys. There were a bunch of key items I didn't know what to do with. Bottles of oil, a visor, the resonant prototype. Never figured out what to do with these. Same with the echoes and the hive residue, but I was able to look those up afterward. This game doesn't do a lot of hand-holding, which I typically appreciate, but 
the dev could have tossed me a bone here. I just felt confused having these seemingly useless things stuck in my inventory. Okay, let's return to the positive stuff. Gosh, I swear I actually like this game. Earlier, I mentioned there were some advanced moves the game doesn't explicitly tell you about. One of these is a hyper swim move that lets you rocket out of the water. It's really awesome and fun to use. I used it once to do some sequence breaking, which you can do a lot of in this game, so I can't wait to watch some speed runs in the future. And another time to find the game's final hidden mutation. I'm gonna warn you, if you go for the final mutation, know that it sucks. It probably took me over 9,000 tries to reach it, but it's hidden so well, I can't help but admire the setup. Not only do you have to know the hyper swim move exists, but you also have to find an optional augment that increases your fall rate so you can get some serious speed when falling into water. Absolute amazing Metroidvania moment. Another move you should know about is the sticky bomb jump. Again, it's not told to you, but it's super helpful once you figure it out. You basically just throw a bomb down at your feet and jump right as it explodes to get more height. Simple, easy, and effective. Gotta love it. The last thing I want to talk about is this aha moment I had. I had a really awesome aha moment in this game, which is rare for me because I play so many Metroidvanias. It happened when I discovered the path to the Coral Fissure. I was stuck for a long time trying to figure out where to go, and in desperation, I found an area with these seemingly innocuous jellyfish things floating in the air. Because I hadn't made any progress in like an hour, I was like, fuck it, and just jumped. I pogoed off the jellyfish and actually found the critical path forward. Pogoing isn't something you're told you can do in the game, so it felt great to discover this all on my own. I love when MVs respect players' intelligence. Conclusion. Rebel transmutes an odd amalgamation of Metroid-like and Soulsvania I don't find to be complimentary. Runbacks and corpse running just have to go. We're done with this shit. it's time to move on. However, despite these antiquated Souls-like mechanics, I ultimately had a wonderful time. If I could sum up why I like Rebel Transmute in one phrase, I'd say this. Even though this game can be disrespectful of players' time, it's very respectful to players' intelligence. Rebel Transmute may give you objective markers, but how you get there is all on you. The game refuses to hold your hand throughout its 20-ish hour playthrough, and because of this, its sense of discovery is heightened throughout. Yes, the game was kind of buggy at launch, and its level design, enemy placement, and combat aren't the greatest, but its story is serviceable and its exploration is top tier. And in my opinion, Exploration is the most important aspect of a Metroidvania. You have to create a world I want to explore, I have to be rewarded for exploring it, and I want to feel like the discoveries I make along the way are impactful. To that, I'd say Rebel Transmute is a success. Now, whether you will love Rebel Transmute is going to depend on the type of gamer you are. First and foremost, you got to be a Metroidvania fan. The way this game revels and how lost it can make you isn't for the weak of heart, and neither is its difficulty. If you were raised on the NES or just love that retro 8-bit look and feel, Rebel's definitely going to be up your alley. Just keep in mind this is a Metroid-like, despite the game's Hollow Knight inspirations. Moon doesn't move or feel like a combat-hardened warrior. She's clunky, for lack of a better word. So, hardcore MV vets, check this one out. MV noobs and MV fans who joined our ranks because of Hollow Knight, approach with caution. You may not appreciate how difficult it is and how clunky and limited the controls in combat are, but for MV enthusiasts who decide to give Rebel Transmute a chance, you'll discover it's one of the greatest and passionate love letters to the genre.